Welcome to VMware Explore 2022 with the CTO Advisor Studio. Come on in and consume some content. Welcome back to our coverage of VMware Explore 2022. Just had a really great conversation with one of the community members and they asked me, how do you compare VMware Explore to VMworld? Day two of VMware Explore, I can honestly say this feels like VMware Explore. It doesn't feel like VMworld yeah. anymore. More. VMworld, as we know it, ended in 2019. VMware Explore, still a big conference. 100%. Still intense, still huge investments, but the pre, post, during, it is a different event, and I'm okay with that because the conversations are deep. We're about to go into one of these deep sponsored conversations with Chris Rogers, evangelist at Zerto. Chris, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you, Keith. Thank you for having me. Uh, yeah, I completely agree with you. I, I love VM Explore, VMware Explore this year, and the conversations have been vastly different to what we had at VMworld, right? We're talking about this multi-cloud world, and you know, it's, it's, been, it's been great. Yeah, it's been really, really fun so far. Yeah, it seems like in 2019, we're mainly focused on going from vSphere 6.7 to vSphere 7.0 or whatever yeah, the current yeah. uh, version was. That was the deep conversation. Yeah. Now the deep conversations are around what does Tanzu application platform 1.3 actually mean? Or yeah. Tanzu mission control. Or how do I integrate this thing with Red Hat or Google Cloud? Etc. So we're going to go into not the application side of that conversation, mm -hmm. but the, I've talked to a, quite a few data protection companies, and Zero yeah. does do some data protection, yeah, but we're yeah. going to talk about workload protection. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, disaster recovery, ransomware recovery, etc., is a big part of what this community does. Yeah, absolutely. And Zerto's yeah. been a, a part of that. I can't help but notice the commonality of VMware, vSphere across all of the major cloud providers. Yeah. Not the way that we thought it would be maybe five years ago. Mm -hmm. Very different way, each cloud provider has a different solution. Yeah. So let's, let's off the bat, which cloud providers does Zerto recover doing a disaster recovery uh, process or solution into their VMware cloud compartment? Yeah, great question. So, so Zerto is really blessed in the fact that we're pretty agnostic in the way we do it. We, we approach uh, data protection and disaster recovery. So, you know, Google Cloud VMware Engine, Azure VMware Solution, Oracle VMware Solution, all of those are supported. Um, native Azure, native AWS as well. And we have, you know, 350 plus managed service providers who run their own VMware clouds as well. You know, like OVH that are here as well. And, you know, those big companies that are doing their own thing as well as the public cloud providers. So, yeah, we support all those platforms to give you know customers and users the ultimate flexibility to you know adopt that hybrid multi-cloud approach, which is kind of what this conference is all about, right? Like trying to intertwine your, your vSphere and your hybrid cloud and your Tanzus and your Kubernetes, all of those concepts into one kind of holistic view, right? Yeah, so we're not going to get into the details of minutia of how Zerto does orchestration yeah. and DR. That's kind of a a, a told story. Mm -hmm. We spent some time a couple of years ago doing some pretty deep research comparing the public cloud providers. Yeah. What I am interested in is like this veneer of vSphere across the multiple cloud mm -hmm. providers. Once I'm into the console, once, once I'm into vCenter, vSphere is vSphere. Whether yeah. I'm in vCenter that's being hosted in AWS or vSphere that's been hosted in Azure, it's vCenter. Yeah. Where I start to experience differences is, is, is issues that I think are very relevant for that disaster recovery. If I have a VM that needs a public IP address, mm -hmm. it's a different process to yeah. do that in each one of the clouds. And if I'm protecting, let's say, my DMZ mm -hmm. in the private data center, and I want to fail over to Oracle Cloud infrastructure, there's a temptation for me to say, you know what, I can build that. That's mm -hmm. just SRM. Yeah, yeah. Where, what am I missing? Um, I think um, 
just just making sure that you understand that each platform has those unique common unique commonalities, but those unique differences throughout the platform. So SRM will work with vSphere to vSphere, right? But what happens if you want to start adopting native cloud technologies as well? Or you want to start adopting Kubernetes on those environments as well, right? With SRM, you're kind of it kind of stuck with that platform, right? It's VMs only, it's to from vSphere to vSphere. So it's an okay job of doing that, right? But if you start looking at the wider community and the wider world you want to get to, it's very unlikely you're just going to be choosing one platform or one way of running applications, right? Your new application's coming out next year. You're probably not going to develop that on VMs. You're probably going to use Tanzu or, or, or OpenShift or somewhere like that, right? So if you, if you go down the path of an SRM, for instance, you're going to be tied into another solution then, so going out and purchasing another solution, a more complexity in that, in that, in that hybrid cloud world, whereas if you chose a, a solution like, like Zerto, for instance, then we kind of do the data protection in a different way. We try and make it simple and easy throughout all your hybrid cloud estate. So that includes Kubernetes applications as well. So we can do VMs, Kubernetes, in a very consistent manner. So people are understanding what the tool's doing, how it's working, across those VMs, across whether it's on Oracle Cloud or, or native Azure or vSphere or, or any of the other platforms we mentioned. So you, it's just bringing that simplicity back down because you know, running hybrid estates isn't easy, right? It's, it's, it's complex, but if we can take the, the hassle out of the DR piece of that and make it nice and easy for people to understand, then I think that's where, where the, the real value proposition comes from. So I guess I, I do have to penetrate this, this, this layer of technology weed and talk through that a little bit. Because yeah, when, when I'm thinking about protecting a Kubernetes workload yeah. versus protecting a VM, a monolithic application, mm -hmm. those are two very 100%. different things. Like yeah. getting the data, replicating the data for a persistent volume in Kubernetes and replicating a VMDK, pretty much the same thing. It's yeah. I just need to, to get degree, it over yeah, yeah, to yeah. a degree, it's the same thing. Yeah. But the orchestration of, of recovering <laughs> that is different. So where's that where where does where does data replication kind of stop and Zerto start? I know Zerto does both, but yeah, yeah. What no, that's that a great question, yeah. yeah. Um, so I think it's I think it's adding all those layers around it. So yeah, as you said, like moving the data from A to B isn't really the challenge that we solve, right? There's many tools out there, you know, you can manually do it yourself and copy and run a script to copy your persistent data from, from A to B, wherever that may be. What, what the complexity comes is, how are you going to orchestrate spinning that up? How are you going to keep multiple thousands of different checkpoints in, in, in check when they've all got just UIDs? How are you going to understand which one of those is the one you need to recover to? How are you going to build analytics around that? How are you going to understand what your RPOs and RTOs really are? How are you going to test all of those things? So that's where Zerto brings that whole kind of automation, orchestration, and, and the simplicity back down to it is that we do the data replication for you as well. So using our CDP engine that we've actually put inside of you know, the ESXi host, we've now put that inside of Kubernetes as well. So we're using the same type of technology inside the Kubernetes stack to replicate that data every five to 10 seconds. So what, what, you're, what we're used to and our customers are used to seeing in their VMs with that super quick RPOs, they're going to get in Kubernetes as well, but then we're capturing every single piece of the application that makes up that Kubernetes app at the same time as well. So it's not just about the persistent data, it's about secrets, it's about services, it's about you know, all those other pieces that make up applications. And the way that we've designed our, our Kubernetes um, data protection is actually with developers in mind. So instead of it being um, you know, break out into UI and then protect everything afterwards, we're doing data protection as code. So inside of those Kubernetes applications where you're actually configuring Kubernetes to tell you how many pods and how many, um, you know, uh, how many things you want to restart and all those types of things, that's where you're actually annotating your application to say, protect my application Zerto. So as soon as Kubernetes spins up those, uh, those uh, um, pods and those containers, they're born protected with Zerto. So it's ne never an afterthought and we're trying to make sure we make it as simple as possible for those developers and the DevOps guys to kind of adopt data protection because we've seen you know, containers have taken this massive up curve in the last five years or so, and they came from like, you know, the, the really upstart, quick start businesses, right? But now as we start moving into enterprise, we're seeing like compliance come into it and having these data protection strategies, and suddenly people are saying, well, I don't want that to take up my time, right? I'm a developer, I want to, I want to develop applications. So if we can give them the tools to say, it's one line of code to protect your whole application, just use that across your whole, uh, your whole application, group it together, we capture everything that you want inside of that, 
uh, protection group, and then we recover the whole thing as one, not just persistent data. So let's let's penetrate that protect, protection group a little bit. You know, yeah. I, you know, we have I have my state information yeah. from a database perspective. Mm -hmm. So my application information. I have my services, my control plane, my Kubernetes control plane. Mm -hmm. What people you know don't think about a lot is that yes, I can have auto scaling but the application control plane is always constantly running. Mm -hmm. It's rare when I have to restart my entire application cluster. Yep. That cluster infrastructure is running. So the dependencies, is the database working, is the persistent volumes mounted, mm -hmm. that sequence of recovery. Yep. Is Zerto orchestrating all yep. that in the DR location? So yep. recovering my control plane in my data plane so we, in yep. a way that I can actually recover the state, the app in a stateful manner because the the microservice may be you know one UID and then the database another UID. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so we're, we're we're capturing. So every time we do a checkpoint, we're capturing the state of everything that you've tagged inside of that protection group from that point in time. So every time we create those five or ten second intervals, we're capturing the state at that point in time. So we're then recovering every, the whole Kubernetes application to that point in time throughout the whole application. So we're recovering you know, from five seconds, 10 seconds previous to that whole application. Um, we, we need a Kubernetes somewhere to stand it up, right? So um, you know, you, you, we're not doing DR for the actual Kubernetes runtime or anything else like that. So right. you'd use EKS, AKS, Tanzu, OpenShift, whatever it is, and replicate. And again, being agnostic, we can go between those as well. We don't have to choose one or, one or the other. So, um, we're doing data protection in a different way. Instead of being tied to a platform or, or a storage piece and using snapshots, we're, we're trying to take it you know, to the next level. Like we did a bit with like hypervisor replication, we kind of said, well, it's okay the way we're doing it today. Let's see if we can do it better. We're doing the same thing with Kubernetes and actually saying like customers needed that for VMs. Kubernetes is a completely different monster, right? The, the containers change all the time and the, they, sometimes VMs last for decades, right? Sometimes containers last for seconds, right? So how do we make sure we're protecting the data that those are, that, that those containers are creating, well, CDP is the answer to that, right? So making sure we can keep all those checkpoints in sync, and we're, rec we're recovering the whole app as one cohesive unit. So let's zoom back out, and let's yeah. talk about that portability or cross public cloud providers. Yeah. So today I'm replicating my VMware, vSphere, VMs. L let's, zoom, let's even zoom out further than that. I'm replicating my application. Yeah, yeah. From one, data center or cloud provider to another data center cloud provider using Zerto. Yeah. We talk about those nuance and differences. Mm -hmm. How portable, either from a vSphere or Kubernetes perspective, is that blueprint, let's use the term blueprint mm -hmm. that I use, so I, I've set up my, my application replication and data protection mm -hmm. policy and orchestration for AWS. Yeah. And I want to move that process now from AWS to Oracle Cloud. Mm -hmm. How difficult of a migration is that? So with Zerto, very easy. Um, moving the workloads, we have a, you know, I think it might be four clicks failover to be able to move that application into there. And then essentially once you've moved that data into the new cloud environment, using Zerto, it's going to look and feel identically the same, right? We, it's the same buttons, the same workflows. And then we just we know which platform your VMs are running on or your Kubernetes containers are running on, so we can then just slightly change what we're asking you, what questions, right? So if we're moving you know, inside of Azure, for instance, we're going to be asking you about VNets. If we're going into EC2, we're going to be asking about availability zones. And those, so we're going to subtly change the questions we ask you in the, in, the, in the workflow, but it's going to feel the same to a user, right? They're going to be able to answer those questions without really thinking about it, but just, in, just depending on where you're landing is we're going to subtly change the workflow to make sure we capture the information we need to recover that data into where you're going to. But for Kubernetes, we don't even see what platform you're really running on because we're in the K8 stack itself, right? So actually, if you're moving from EKS to AKS to Tanzu, it doesn't matter to us. We don't really see the underlying platform. We see inside the Kubernetes stack. So it would be the same annotation, the same tag inside the inside of the, uh, the Kubernetes application itself, which can then re-protect um, uh, that application across. So. so last question, we've talked a lot about the experience. Yeah. What we haven't talked about is how is this packaged? Mm -hmm. like, what is this? Is this a is this a box? Is this a piece of software? Is yeah. it a SaaS offering? <laughs> How is it packaged? It, it's completely software only, right? So I think the multi-cloud world is becoming it's becoming harder to kind of 
justify hardware, right? If we're, we want to be agile, we want to take the data where we want to and, and kind of spin, uh, you know, we don't, we're not, we're not on exit data centers that's going to take 24, 46 months. So being software only is a great advantage to us. Um, and so software only, you know, licensed on a per, a per VM basis or in K8s on the, the, the amount of CPUs or work nodes you use. So again, we, we've had that licensing model that allows users to scale the way they want. So instead of saying per worker node, which usually means people have big worker nodes, but fewer of them, right? We're saying, well, we're going to do it on a per CPU, which means you can scale your worker nodes how you want. You can have 100 with two CPUs, or you can have one with 200 CPUs. It's going to cost you the same either way, right? So it allows you to adopt Kubernetes or your, your how you want to architect, not based on licensing, but based on your best practice, how your company wants to do it, rather than what's going to save you the most amount of money. Well, Chris, I really appreciate you taking out the time to come and talk to me about Zerd. I've asked you some pretty tough questions. <laughs> you always do, Keith. You always do. If, That's what we're here for. <laughs> if you don't think I've asked Chris tough enough questions, and I, 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 frankly, I find it hard to believe, <laughs> you can DM me on Twitter, <laughs> at CTO Advisor. You want to learn more about the CTO Advisor, you can find us on the web, thectoadvisor.com. Make sure to tune in for more VMware Explorer content We've just scratched the surface. We went deep unexpectedly into Kubernetes and data protection and workload protection. Who knows where we're going to go <laughs> when we talk to many more people from VMware themselves. Talk to you next episode of CTO Advisor Studio at VMware Explorer 2022.